Welcome to Liner Notes, a podcast about how scholars plan to stay organized and the tools they use. In each episode, I'll be interviewing a scholar about what's in their pen case, or something akin to a pen case if they don't have one, how they plan their time, and their secrets to an organized academic life. I'm Catherine Rye Jewell, otherwise known as Kate, a historian and professor of history at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. Our guest today is Victor Assal, a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Albany, where he is also director at the, of the Center for Policy Research, as well as co-director for the Project on Violent Conflict. His research focuses on the choice of violence by non-state organizational actors, as well as the causes of political discrimination by states against different groups, such as sexual minorities, women, and ethnic groups. He also researches the impact of nuclear proliferation and on the pedagogy of simulations, which he'll talk a little bit about today. He is also, as I have seen mentioned several times, the nicest person on Twitter. You can follow him there at Victor underscore Asal, A-S-A-L. I will also give credit to Victor as the person whose words gave me the final push to start this podcast. So I really appreciate that. And, and it's great to have him here. Welcome, Victor. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the talk. It's great to have you here. So we're going to start out with segment one, which I call the what's in your pen case, assuming you have one segment. And I'd just like you to highlight three items uh, from your stash that are your must haves. Let me start, Kate, by saying that I'm not cool and I have no pen case. So we're just going to not have a pen case. My apologies. That's all right. <laughs> but in terms of three things I must have. So the first thing I must have is I got to have music. Okay, for some reason, music helps me focus. And, uh, you know, I use the music thing on my computer. Uh, I also use YouTube a lot. I have long lists of different, uh, what I call my work music, which is general music, my country music, my work pop, my top list of songs, uh, my Israeli songs. So I have a whole bunch of different work lists, uh, sorry, music lists. Uh, I like to listen to music. Second thing. Um, so Kate, I have, uh, ADHD fairly severe and dyslexia. Uh, interestingly, the ADHD was not, I, dyslexia was diagnosed when I couldn't read until third grade, but the ADHD was actually diagnosed as an adult. And when I told the doctor what I did for a living, he laughed and he said, oh, you can't be a professor with that kind of ADHD. And I said, well, I've actually managed to do that. Um, so what I desperately, desperately need is a calendar without a calendar that gives me regular reminders of, you know, Victor, pay attention, do this, pay attention, do this. I would get a little lost. So no, not a little lost, a lot lost. So I have found uh, a calendar, the Outlook calendar is what I use to be extraordinarily uh, helpful. Finally, um, if I was going to marry an app, the app that I would marry uh, or the uh, web page that I would marry uh, is Google Scholar. Mm -hmm. um, Google Scholar has been an enormous help in terms of literature views, finding stuff, figuring out uh, what the important literature in the area that I'm looking at for a particular paper is. And so I would say that Google Scholar uh, is, is really key for as a must have for trying to get work done. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about the music. So I'm one of the people who can't, and it's rather tragic in some ways because I'm writing this book about college radio, which is all about music, but I'm one of the people who can't work when I have music on that has words in it. Mm. So how does that work for you? Uh, well, I mean, I can work without music and I can work with music, uh, but it, it doesn't bother me to have music um, with words. It just has no impact on me. And the music seems to keep me somewhat focused for some weird reason. If I had a magic wand, Kate, if I had a magic wand, I would wave it for you and make it work for you, but I don't. <laughs> it's sad. <laughs> uh, so it sounds like you're primarily a digital based person, a digitally based scholar. Is that true? Or do you kind of have times where you're moving to paper. Ah, so, um, Kate, in addition to dyslexia and ADHD, I also have dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is I have crappy, 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 crappy handwriting. And so, um, I have to, nobody can read anything I've written. 
And so I've got to do it digital. If I am thoroughly convinced if we were not in a digital age, uh, I would not have been an academic because no one would have ever read what I wrote because I couldn't read it. And the people who would translate it into book couldn't read it. So no. No. Yeah. Um, and so are you Mac or PC? I'm PC. Uh, my first computer was a Mac. Now, this is back in the eighties. Tells you how old I am. And, um, I got annoyed because actually nineties, I got annoyed because Mac was religious in the sense that everything had to be made by one, uh, manufacturer. And if you, you know, you couldn't use anything from anybody else. And that got to the point where it really annoyed me. And so I converted to PC and I've stayed PC ever since. So, uh, so for segment two, this is sort of the, how do you plan your time and your work? How do you, we've established that you're a, a, a digital person, but how do you, how do you structure your day? How do you go about organizing your work and managing all the various things that you have to do as a scholar? Well, um, Kate, if, uh, if I could show you my um, calendar, you would see. I have everything booked in, what I'm doing, what I'm, you know, how I'm work, work, what I'm working on. And the blank areas are not really blank. They've just been blanked because I've done it and I've moved it uh, back. Okay? So I am religious about, you know, keeping myself focused on what I need to do on the calendar. Mm -hmm. And so that has been helpful. But that's that. what gets me focused and what reminds me because Outlook sends reminders is, um, is that. I will also send myself, you know, stuff that's more urgent. I will send myself email reminders. And those emails stay in there until I do the damn stuff that needs to get done so I can erase that damn email. <laughs> achieve the inbox zero that is correct. <laughs> well i actually have occasionally gotten my inbox down to five or six emails it is a wonderful thing it is and so when you're scheduling your time in your calendar do you break it down into specific tasks or is it just kind of like general writing time or general teaching prep i don't know time? very specific i well so prep i have a i have a intro to world politics class it's 102 prep 102 uh, I'm working on a specific paper with, uh, you know, maybe one day with Kate, we'll work on a paper together. Uh, it says, um, uh, write the literature review for that boring paper with Kate. And so it is specific. Each of the time frames is specific. And a lot of times, I, I mean, I, I, I'm doing a lot of service stuff and so forth. So a lot of times I'm not able to, to get to what I need to. So they move forward. And if there's something, let's say I have a conference in April um, and I'm working on a paper with some people, then I will put in every single week an hour or two hours that reminds me that I need to work on that element. And you just kind of chip away at it. Try. Yeah. Or I get to the point where it's eight hours and stay focused and you have to finish this, Victor. When I was writing my dissertation, I developed a system. It was when you could put tasks on your Google Calendar. And I, I didn't, I never really knew because I had a little baby at the time and I never really knew if I was going to have enough time, you know, or when that time that I was going to be able to work was going to fall because everything changed during, you know, with the schedules. And so I just set a goal of say, you know, five 20 minute sessions of working on the dissertation. So I don't, I, I need to set, you know, a, a, a chunk of time and that's, you know, two, three hours, depending upon what I'm working on. That's what I'm, that's what I've got. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me, what is, this is our third segment. What is uh, one secret or a couple of secrets you could share to an organized scholarly life? Uh, I would be happy, Kate. Um, keep a list. Keep a list of what you need to do and actually pay attention to that list and, you know, cross stuff off. Prioritize what's most important at the top. Okay. And for academics, some of us are blessed and we only have to teach one class a year, fine. But, you know, some of us need to teach two classes a year or four classes a year or eight classes a year. Uh, one of my colleagues, so I'm an editor of a journal, I don't know how he does this. He teaches six classes every semester. He's at a community college and he's an editor of the Journal of Political Science Education. And how he manages to do all this, I'm amazed. 
but keep a list of what you need to get done and prioritize those things that have a deadline and, and make that work. Um, I've already spoken about this, but use reminders. Outlook will annoy you. Use those things that will annoy you. They can be very helpful. Um, we are academics. As academics, um, by the way, your cat is stretching behind you and is very, very cute. Putting on a show. Oh, we got to readjust here and do some cleaning. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. She's very cute. So uh, now that I've interrupted my own uh, pontificating, which I will do on a regular basis, when you think about what you're going to teach and what you're going to research, focus on what really inspires you and thrills you. Okay. Everything we do, whether teaching or research, is going to be at some point boring. But you want to have that thing that inspires you and thrills you that's going to keep you going through the boring parts. And a, an academic life is, is much longer than a year or two years. And at some point, that, what, the thing that makes interest you the most might change. And that's fine. And then focus on the thing that's going to keep you inspired and change into that area. I think that really, um, really is important. Uh, for people starting in academia, but also for people who are continuing in academia, I think something that a lot of people don't pay attention to is the need to figure out how to balance research and teaching. Okay, because we need to we need to do both, and some of us are luckier than others in terms of how much teaching we need to do, how much research we need to do, but most of us need to balance those things. One really effective way to balance is to be teaching stuff that you really love about a topic that you really love, because then you can try and integrate the teaching and the research uh, um, together. Uh, in terms of teaching, figure out a way of teaching that doesn't make your students want to kill themselves. Okay, you want to figure out a way of teaching that is going to engage your students to so they really care. Almost every teaching at some point is going to require you to, you know, just talk to them, but that shouldn't be what all of your teaching or most of your teaching is about. You want to think of some way to engage them. So I teach about uh, international relations, comparative politics, uh, political violence and political discrimination. And I have spent a lot of time thinking about exercises and games that can engage students in a way that really makes them think differently. So, uh, for example, would you like an example, Kate? Yeah, I'd love to hear about these. So on political violence, most of my students, their idea of what political violence is comes from video games. And nothing is too hard. And, you know, people listen because, you know, you can tell them. I do a uh, game that I call Dali and Vadan, where they go outside. It doesn't matter if it's snowing. It doesn't matter if it's raining. The class is divided into two. And we do a war game where the commander has to stay behind. And um, it's really hard. They don't think it's hard. But when you have 20 people playing at the same time on both sides, or even 15 people playing at the both sides, they get a sense of the complication of what battle is like in a way that is much harder than, um, than you would think if you basing your knowledge on video games. Uh, we also live in a country where discrimination is still a serious issue, uh, but there are those of us who, who have not experienced that. And so I have a game that I use that I call the running game, where I tell the students, okay, I'm gonna give you a half grade bonus on the next quiz. Um, if you're one of the first five people, and I do this in class of 120, if you're one of the first five people uh, who touches the blackboard for this running race. Now, all of you go to the back of the room. Oh, but you 10, I like you, you stand in the middle of the room. And you three, I like you even more, you stand 10 feet away from the blackboard. If you don't want to run, you can go sit down. And all the people in the back, about 90% of them go sit down. Because what's the point? That kind of exercise is a really phenomenal jumping off point for talking to students about power structure, about equality and inequality, and why 
some people just figure, why try? There's no point. There's these larger connections that you have, you know, as a scholar and you want to keep yourself motivated over the long run. You're interested in these kind of higher concepts, these kind of theoretical questions. And, you know, that that sort of informs your day to day that you want to get to the place where you can, you know, be in conversation with those larger ideas. And at the same time in the classroom, you want to bring students into that conversation. Right. And so if you find those tools, you find those mechanisms that, you know, like the, the reminder going off, it like, it kind of forces you into a mode of, of confrontation with, with the idea ultimately that they, in some ways they, they seem connected to me. Yes. Uh, you know, and so, so that's on the teaching side, on the research side, given the challenges that I face. Um, so I've written a lot of papers, Kate, and I think all but one or two have been co-authored. And if you find co-authors that you can work with, that you share a uh, similar interest in, and uh, you, you each have different strengths, uh, that can be extraordinarily useful for getting a lot of research out. Mm -hmm. And that really can make a difference. Is there any particular method to co-authoring a paper that you find that works or is it really based on whoever it is that you're working with? Like, do you build an outline together or do you like each have a, a body of research that complements one another? So like, how, how, do you, how do you go about that? It, I think a lot of it depends upon what we're researching and who I'm working with. Okay. And I think that if I'm an expert in one area of methodology and they're an expert in a different area of methodology and the paper is focusing on their methodology, I'll be spending more time on the lit review. <laughs> and if we're working in an area where I know the methodology better than they do, then they'll be spending more time on the lit review. And usually we work together to figure out what are the hypotheses and how we're testing different stuff. But it really depends. And one of the other things that I found, which has been extremely helpful uh, for my students is I have co-authored papers with students. Now, the key thing with co-authoring papers with students is don't be that jerk. <laughs> and what I mean by that, Kate, is when I say there are people who, when they say co-author with students, means the students do 98% of the work and they put their name on it. If there's ever a situation where the students do more than, uh, more, more than they should, my name goes last, not first, even though my name alphabetically is usually first, but you want to be a real co-author with your students. Okay. And that can be very beneficial to you when you have so many other balls in the air in terms of teaching and service and so forth, but can also really help your students learn what it's like. I mean, I've, I've worked with students on various things. I've also used undergraduate TAs. I've had students come to me and say, Professor Saul, thank you for letting me be an undergraduate TA. I was thinking about being a professor and now I know I really don't want to. And I've had other students come to me and say, Professor Saul, now I know I want to be a professor. So it really, it really, you know, it can be a very educational experience for them. There's a huge swath of people who think being a professor is sitting in your office, uh, smoking a uh, pipe uh, for most of the day. And, with summers off. And with summers <laughs> off, haha. -ha. Uh, and there are some people who, you know, once they have tenure, go in that direction. But for a lot of us who are trying to do our job, it's a, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a full professor and it's still a 50 to 60 hour a week job. That's just the way it is. If you want to be successful and really help your students, you got to put the effort and the time in to make it work. Well, it's so inspiring to hear you talk about the way that your research informs your teaching and your teaching, you know, informs your, your scholarly life and, and sort of your your professionalism. It's really nice to hear that. Well, thank you. I think a lot of academics end up going in the direction and Kate, I'd be curious to hear. So Kate, why did you decide to research what you research? First, it came from very personal kind of sense of history of like a historical problem that I had always noticed in my own life. Ultimately, I found that there was a, a much bigger kind set of questions that I was actually interested in, which I didn't really f figure out until I started my second project which is about college radio and seems very different than conservative Southern industrialists in the new deal era. But ultimately there is a kind of underlying question about business and culture and politics and how they right. intertwine. And I think a lot of professors um, were motivated to go into research because they wanted to understand better some component of who they are and why they are. 
right? There are very fundamental reasons why I study political violence and I study um, political discrimination. Uh, and that's important. What would you say is your is your motivating? So I have experienced both discrimination and I've experienced violence. Um, and uh, I have seen other people experience it and uh, it upsets me greatly and I'm highly opposed to discrimination. So, so Kate, when you look at me, what do you see? Uh, well, I see, I see a man with a beard. Okay. A white beard and a mustache. Thank you. Okay. Well, usually my students say he's a white guy. Uh, and recently they've started to say he's an old white guy. So thanks for noting the beard. Um, but my father was Tunisian and he was a person of color. Uh, and on more than one occasion, people would doubt whether he was really my father when we would go out together and I was a child. And so those things can make a big impression on you, especially given what some people would say. Mm -hmm. Right. And on the other side of things, um, I uh, lived in Israel for 10 years. I served in the Israeli army and I am familiar with oppression and with political violence. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate you, you talking personally about that experience. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think different people are inspired by, by different experiences um, and people should find what really drives them as their focus, both in terms of their research and their teaching. This is so interesting. I so value having your voice as part of this. Well, thank you. I, I hope it's useful. Well, Victor, it's been wonderful to talk to you, and I will see you on, on the Twittersphere. See ya. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.